Hey everyone, Colby right here. We're back at it again. Today's topic, as you can see on the screen, is equity valuation. What the literature says. Our threshold question, what do we know about sell-side analysts based on economic literature? So, just to set the stage, we've spent a lot of time together talking about discounted cash flows models and method of comparables and multiples and residual income model. We've done pro forma financial statements. In the last few discussions, we've talked about the basic return concepts, uh, how, to, how to calculate continuously compounded average returns. We talked about probability distributions. We've talked about how to assess investment performance in actively managed mutual funds, whether that's sharp ratios, trainer ratios, whether that's using CAPM to estimate an alpha, whether that's using uh, multi-factor models to estimate an alpha. And also keep in mind, you can use those multi-factor models to not just estimate an alpha, but also to attribute performance, right? To figure out whether or not these actively managed portfolios are, for instance, tilting more towards value stocks, tilting more towards small stocks, and there's all sorts of other things. But that, that's what we've been talking about in our last few discussions. So we've spent a lot of time talking about what sell-side analysts do and talking about how to estimate uh, performance and attribute performance to actively managed portfolios. Now, I just want to take a few minutes, and I think this will be one of the shorter videos that I record, to just talk to you about what we think we know about the behavior of sell-side analysts based on research and economic literature. Here's what I want to do. There's a couple of older studies, kind of 1999 and, and sort of that vintage I think that data is still relevant. There's still some insights in there that we can look at and, and sort of get some information from. So I want to show you some of the earlier studies and then we're going to kind of walk through time and I'll finish with the most recent study to date that I think is worthwhile when it comes to giving us information about sell side equity analysts. So let's go ahead and jump into it. The first article that I want to bring up is called a study of financial analysts practice and theory. This was published or uh, written by Stanley Block and published in the Financial Analyst Journal in 1999. Financial Analyst Journal is a very well-respected practitioner journal. Uh, in the field of finance, we generally think of having three A-level academic journals, uh, RFS, JFE, and JF. And then on the practitioner side, Journal of Portfolio Management and Financial Analyst Journal. These are the top two practitioner journals. So this is a very good journal. Stanley Block is very well respected. So I don't want to spend too much time setting it up, but he sent out a survey to 900 members of the uh, Association for Investment Management and Research. He got 297 respondents. This page is just showing you what his sample looked like. So you can see over here on the right-hand side, 67% of his sample were uh, CFA charter holders. 54% uh, of his sample had MBAs, and then it also breaks down by experience, and it also breaks down by their undergraduate degree backgrounds. All I really wanted to show you here is, so he breaks down what industry his respondents are in, whether they're at brokerage houses, private money management, investment management counseling, mutual funds, bank trust departments, investment banking, other pension fund. You can see the breakdown of his respondents. But one of the things he asked them was, how frequently do you use present value techniques when you're trying to estimate the fundamental value of a company? Present value techniques would include DCF models, dividend discount models, and residual income models. Basically, anything that requires the use of time value of money principles, those would be present value techniques. And one of the things that's surprising, again, this is 1999, so it's 20 years ago, but one of the things that's surprising is how few of the respondents in this sample actually use present value techniques. You can see that 136 of his, what was it, 270? roughly, sorry, 297, 136 of his 297 respondents never use present value techniques and another 116 only sometimes use those models. So only 45 of the 297 always use some type of present value technique. That's a little bit surprising given how much time we've spent together going over specifically the DCF and the residual income models. That's all I want to pull out from that initial article. Moving on to the next one, what valuation models do analysts use? This is a 2004 paper in Accounting Horizons. 
Uh, I'll be brief on this one as well. So they identify valuation methodologies that are contained in 104 analyst reports. All of the analyst reports are from international investment banks and all reports are for 26 large uh, UK listed firms in three industries, specifically beverages, electronics, and pharmaceuticals. Here is the key table that I want you to see. So they're just asking, you know, what percentage of our uh, research reports use these various models? Over here on the left, it's single period comparative valuation techniques. So this is comparables or multiples. And then over here are the multi-period valuation models. So you've got discounted cash flows model and you've got residual income model. So notice first off that 88.5% of all of the research reports they look at use some sort of PE model, an earnings model. 50% use some sort of sales multiple model. Only 38.5% use DCF and almost nobody's using residual income model. So I'm just wanting you to see that these two early papers are pretty consistent that most analysts are using multiples, specifically earnings multiples, and a much lower percentage of analysts are using DCF models. Okay, moving on, 2005, Journal of Financial Economics. This is one of our top three research journals in the field of finance. Again, it's Review of Financial Studies, Journal of Finance, and Journal of Financial Economics. Those are considered the top three research journals in the field of finance. So this is definitely a well-respected location or well-respected source. So uh, this particular article is based on a database constructed from analyst reports issued by institutional investor, all American team members from 97 to 99. So these are top performing analysts over that time period. Uh, it includes 1,126 complete analyst reports. 56 different sell side analysts from 11 different investment banks and 46 industries up to this date and, and, and maybe even all the way still to today, most people look at this as sort of the holy grail of research done on sell side equity analysts. It's a very broad sample and they did a very thorough job. So because this is such a well-respected source, we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at their results. Okay, first thing I want to show you is this is what we call summary statistics, and I want, to, want you to focus up here. Again, they have 1,126 research reports, and I just want you to notice the breakdown of strong buy, buy, hold, sell, and strong sell recommendations. They also have it broken down by upgrades, reiterations, and downgrades. But here's the first thing I want you to see. Just look at the percentage of the sample in each of those five broad categories, strong buy, buy, hold, sell, strong sell. Notice that 31% of all research reports in their sample were strong buys. Notice that 40% of all research reports were buys. And notice that 28.7%, call it 29%, were holds. Put those three categories together. 99.5% of all analyst research reports in this sample were either strong buy, buy, or hold, which means that only a half a percent of all analyst research reports were sells or strong sells. This is very, very significant. One of the key points that you're going to see me put up on the screen in a few minutes is that one of the things we think we know about sell-side equity analysts is that they're way too optimistic. And this is the data proving that to you. 99.5% of all of the research reports in this sample were strong buy, buy, or hold. That's really kind of crazy. Okay, next thing I want you to see is which valuation models were used in these 1,126 research reports. I'm gonna focus your attention to the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Please notice that for the total sample, 99% of these research reports used some sort of earnings multiple. This is very confirmatory of what we saw in those earlier academic studies. Remember we saw in those earlier academic studies a strong tendency to use multiples and a much lower percentage of the reports or the analysts using DCF models. We see the exact, th exact same thing playing out here. 99% are using earnings multiples. Only roughly 13% are using DCF variations. 
you've got 25% using asset multiples and then 3% something using some other technique. So far and away, the most frequently, most commonly used valuation methodologies are comparables or multiples. Much less frequent is the use of DCF. But I want to make a comment on this. I don't think it's because the DCF is less useful. I think it's just because it takes more time. You've seen this as we spent time together, right? The process of actually becoming an industry expert, becoming a company expert, having an opinion on the macro economy, taking all of your financial statements, getting a revenue forecast, going through all of the cost drivers, getting pro forma financial statements for an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow statement. And then from that, estimating cash flows and, and then getting your um, getting your WAC, your weighted average cost of capital, your discount rate, and, going, and, and getting a steady state growth rate. And if you're not going to get a steady state growth rate, then getting an exit multiple. The process of going through all that is really laborious and onerous. And so I think a lot of analysts just take the shorter route, right? Like they just use the easier method, which is the earnings multiples. But that also actually gives me a little bit of hope that if you're willing to do the pick and shovel work, there aren't as many people out there doing DCF as you think. Although I'm gonna show you updated data at the end of this, suggesting that actually today, we are seeing more analysts use DCF than we were seeing in those early years. But this is the early data. Uh, I think I actually wanna skip past this slide. Okay, this one is really fascinating and I'm gonna have to help you understand this. There's a lot of numbers on the screen. What they did is they ran a regression and the regression on the left-hand side is the stock market reaction to analyst reports. So when analysts put their reports out, what kind of stock market reaction do we see, right? The example I used during our time together was Carnival Cruise Lines. So what this table is trying to do is figure out when uh, Colby Wright puts out his equity analyst report, his updated report and his updated target price and his updated earnings forecast and revenue forecast and his updated recommendation for Carnival Cruise Lines, what kind of market reaction do we get and what drives that? So on the left-hand side is a sort of risk-adjusted market reaction. On the right-hand side are all of these variables. How big is the change in my earnings forecast? That's the first variable. Second variable is a one. It just takes the value of one if this is an upgrade. So if I'm going from a hold to a buy or a buy to a strong buy, this variable takes the value of one, zero otherwise. If it's a downgrade, so if I'm going from strong buy to buy or from buy to hold or from hold to sell, then this downgrade variable takes the value of one, zero otherwise. Uh, this next variable down here is the delta in the target price. So how big is the change in my target price from my previous analyst report? Next variable, super fascinating. They add up the number of positive words in your report, the actual written report, and subtract out the number of negative words. So this is like a tone measure, right? Like how positive is the tone in my report? And then the last variable is is the brokerage house that I work for somehow linked to the firm? In other words, is this not an arm's length report? This takes the value of one as if there is some sort of linkage. I want you to look over here in column five. That's the specification we're gonna focus on. Please note anything with one asterisk means it's significant at the 10% level. P-value is 10% or lower. Two asterisks means P-value is 5% or lower. Three asterisks means significant at the 1% level. So p-value is 1% or less. So an asterisk means we think it's statistically significant according to p-values. Okay, so what matters? The question is what drives stock market reaction? First off, notice that the delta in the earnings forecast is statistically significant. So when an analyst writes a report and in that report, there is a significant difference in the earnings forecast from the previous report, you get stock market reaction. Now look, I need you to understand what this is saying is that sell side equity analysts have the power to move markets, right? In your report, if you significantly change your earnings forecast, that can lead to significant market reaction. Think about that the power to influence and move markets. That's what we're talking about here. Interestingly, if it's an upgrade, it is not statistically significant. There is no 
statistically significant reaction in the stock market to an upgrade. This makes sense though, because we know that analysts are excessively optimistic and it seems like the market gets that. The market knows that you have a tendency for whatever reason to be way too optimistic. And so when you upgrade a stock, it doesn't mean much to them. However, notice the downgrade variable. The downgrade variable is statistically significant, specifically when you downgrade a stock, there's a negative stock market reaction. You should know this. You should know this as a sell side analyst, that when you put out a report with a downgrade, you have the potential to uh, significantly adversely impact the stock price of that company. What else is statistically significant? Well, if there's a significant delta in the target price. So what we're talking about is from your last researched report to this current research report, if there's a big change in the target price, this can also statistically significantly move markets. And then lastly, and I think this is just fascinating, even the tone of your report can move the markets. Remember this variable is the number of positive words minus negative words in the report. It is statistically significant at the 1% level. So I want you to see this so that you'll know if you're changing your earnings forecast, if it's a downgrade, if you're changing the target price, if uh, the tone of the article, uh, if the tone of the article is positive or negative and how positive or negative, all of these things can actually move the market. Okay. Next thing, and again, I think this is super interesting to look at. This shows you the percentage of research reports in their sample where the stock in the report actually hit the 12 month price target within 12 months, right? So if you look over here and here's target achieved during any of these time periods. So they had 818 stocks in this particular sample. Notice that 54.28% of all of those stocks hit the target price in the research report, 54.28%. But there's something really, really informative here. Notice that for strong buy recommendations, only 45% of the stocks hit that target price in the next 12 months. For, for buy recommendations, 57% hit that target price within the next 12 months. For hold recommendations, 77% hit that target price in the next 12 months. And these next two, we can't put too much weight on because the sample sizes are so small, but 100% of the sell and strong sell recommendations hit the target price. Well, do you notice a trend? As the recommendations get more pessimistic, as the recommendations get more pessimistic, it is more likely that stock will actually hit the target price. And that's very, very significant. And this is just contributing to this theme that sell-side equity analysts are way too optimistic and positive. You can see it right here. Your strong buy recommendations, only 45% of the time do the stocks hit that target price. 57% for buys, 77% for holds. Okay, this actually breaks it down, um, same thing what percentage of all of the research reports, what percentage of the stocks hit the target price over the next 12 months, but now they break it down. So here's the total sample, but they use the different valuation models. So you can see that in the total sample for anybody using a PE ratio as their multiple, 54% of the time the stocks actually hit that target price. Uh, for discounted cash flows models, 52% of the time, the stocks actually hit the target price. Well, I want to focus on downgrades. We know that downgrades lead to a statistically significant reaction in the stock market. We know that analysts are too optimistic, so it would be unusual and very informative for analysts to downgrade. So I want to really zero in on these downgrades. And let's just make sure we understand this. For all of the research reports that represent downgraded recommendations, those that used PE multiples, the stock hit the target price roughly 64% of the time. For, for uh, analyst reports using relative PE multiples, those stocks hit the target price almost 79% of the time. For those using EBITDA multiples, it was 77%. Revenue multiples, 12%. 
Discounted cash flow models is at 73%. Economic value added models at 67%. Price to book models at 58%. And other models at 75%. What I'm wanting you to see is the relative PE, the EBITDA, and the DCF models all seem to perform in about the same zone. Roughly 75% of the time for those models in downgrade, uh, in downgrade research reports, those models, let me say that again more clearly, sorry for the stumbling. For all research reports that represent downgrades, uh, those that use relative PE, EBITDA, and DCF models, the underlying stocks hit the target price in the research report about 70 to 75% of the time on average. Much, much higher than any other models you hear, see here except for the other models. And I'm assuming residual income models would be one of the things in that category. Okay, so uh, I've got one more, one more uh, academic article I want to show you, but I do want to pause for what I'm going to call a few mid-game takeaways. So what do we think we know from what I've showed you so far? Well, sell-side analysts are way too optimistic. The market gets this, and that's why downgrades and sell recommendations are viewed as more informative in the eyes of the market. Seems like everyone uses multiples as a valuation methodology. DCF models are much less frequently used than multiples. Looks to me like the PE and EBITDA multiples do pretty well and the DCF performs about as well as the EBITDA multiples. Okay, last paper. This is inside the black box of sell-side financial analysts. This is by Brown et al., Journal of Accounting Research 2015. This is considered one of the top three journals for accounting, so also a fairly reliable source. Uh, they ended up with a survey of 365 analysts. They also did 18 follow-up interviews. I thought you might like to know, though, that they actually sent out invitations to 3,341 sell-side equity analysts. So it was a really, really broad pool and they got about a 10%, 11% response rate, which is not bad. So lots of good information in this paper. I've tried to whittle it down. First question, who are the key clients of sell-side analysts? You can see here far and away, the most important clients for sell-side analysts are hedge funds and mutual funds. They were asked how important are these clients? It was a scale of zero to six. Six is most important, zero means not important. You can see a really big break point here after mutual funds. So clearly hedge funds and mutual funds are the clients that you're catering to the most when you're a sell-side equity analyst. Okay, next big question. What matters most for compensation? I think this is super important for you to see because we spent the lion's share of our time together trying to make you experts in modeling. Try to help you get really good at pro forma financial statements and DCF models and residual income models and comparables and multiples. But what I want you to see is uh, the respondents to this survey say that the most important thing driving their compensation is their industry knowledge. Uh, I think that's really informative and it makes sense to me because your models are only good as your inputs and your inputs are going to come from your understanding of the industry and the company. So one of the things you should spend a lot of time doing and reading about if you want to try to become a really expert sell side equity analyst is you need to become an industry expert. In fact, this blew my mind. Look at the profitability of your stock recommendations is very low. So a lot of these hedge funds and mutual funds aren't actually relying on your stock recommendations. They want to pay you because of your industry expertise. So know that as you go into it. Okay, next question. What matters most for estimating earnings? What matters most for estimating earnings? So again, notice what tops the list. Your industry knowledge. Notice what second private communication with management. That's a little bit surprising. Earning con earnings conference calls come in third, management's earnings guidance comes in fourth, and then there's a bit of a break point and it goes down from there. So again, the real way that you add value both for your customers, but also in how you estimate earnings is being an industry expert. Pick one or two industries and get really good in those industries. But also this is fascinating private communication with management 
is the number two most important thing when it comes to estimating earnings. They actually drill down on this. What communication with management matters most in estimating earnings? So what matters most when estimating earnings? Look at the first thing, private phone calls with management. Second one, Q&A portion of earnings conference calls. Uh, you should know in the written text of this article, the authors point out that many of the sell-side equity analysts that they interviewed said that they do have access to the CEOs and CFOs and that they do make private phone calls to them and that that's a significant driver of the earnings. Well, they asked the similar questions, just a little bit different. What communication with management matters most in recommending stocks? Again, number one on the list, private phone calls with management. Look, there's a couple of key takeaways from this. Number one, you need to be really great industry experts. Number two, you need to develop good relationships with the management of the company so you have access to them. Number two and number three on this list are company or plant visits going and kicking the tires. And number three are road shows and then it feels like there's a break point after that. Okay, this is what I really wanted to get to. This is the most recent data I have. What valuation models are used? Again, this is a 2015 article. So here's the question. How often do you use the following valuation models to support your stock recommendations? Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken here, yeah, six is the highest, right? So this was a scale of zero to six. Six would mean the most frequent, zero would mean least frequent. Notice that PE or price to earnings growth models are, are the top of the list, but this is interesting to me. DCF is not far behind. So 61% of the sample very frequently uses PE multiples models. 60% use DCFs. This tells me that sell-side equity analysts are actually using DCF models more today than the previous literature suggested they were. Residual income model, which I tried to argue in class, actually there's some empirical research suggesting that that's the most accurate of the models that we use, still is not getting much traction. You can see 69, call it 70%, use it very infrequently and only 5% use it frequently. Last thing I wanna show you here, what if, they ask this really interesting question, what if your earnings recommendation, so what if your earnings or your stock recommendation is low or negative? So what would be the ramifications of putting out a really low earnings forecast or a negative stock recommendation? This I just, this made me chuckle when I saw this. The number one most likely outcome of doing that would be an increase in your investing client's perception of your credibility. This to me again, just corroborates this notion that everyone in the world knows sell side equity analysts are way too optimistic. So if you have the courage if you have the courage to actually be a little bit more realistic, a little bit more pessimistic, it's gonna increase your street cred. But notice the number two most likely outcome is you might lose access to management. And by the way, this helps to explain one of the reasons why sell-side equity analysts are so overly optimistic. They're worried that if they're too pessimistic, if they're anomalously, exceptionally negative, they're gonna lose access to management. And we already saw Access to management and private phone calls are some of the most important factors driving earnings forecasts and stock recommendations. So it is a bit of a trade-off. There's one other reason I wanna put out there for why sell-side equity analysts are a little bit optimistic. It's because we've observed herding amongst sell-side equity analysts. Herding, what I mean by that is as in like a buffalo herd, animals moving together in a herd, H-E-R-D. The reason that there's herding amongst the analysts, they tend to sort of gravitate together. Their earnings forecasts converge, their stock recommendations converge, is because imagine that there's 20 analysts covering a stock, they all have a buy recommendation, and you're the one analyst that puts out a sell recommendation. Now imagine that the stock takes off and does great, so the other 20 analysts look like they were right, um, and you were wrong, you're probably going to lose your job. Right, the other 20 analysts predicted a buy recommendation. You were the lone wolf out there saying sell and you were wrong. This could have really steep consequences for your career. But if you just join the other 20 analysts and you're like, ah, fine, buy recommendation. And let's say, then let's say that the stock tanks. Well, your defense is everybody else thought the same thing. 
you can't fire me because every other analyst thought it was a buy recommendation as well. So this gets back to this idea of the defensibility of your position. Very few analysts like to find themselves hanging out on a limb by themselves because then it's not defensible if you're wrong. I'm not saying that's the right way to behave. I'm just trying to explain what we see. Okay. So at the very end here, let's just revisit those mid-game takeaways and see if we have any updates. These were the mid-game takeaways. Sell-side analysts are too optimistic. Downgrades and sell recommendations are more informative and therefore they get bigger stock market reactions. Seems like almost all sell-side analysts use multiples as valuation methodologies. DCF models are much less frequently used. PE and EBITDA multiples seem to do pretty well and DCF performs about as well as those two multiples. Well, what would we update here? I would say one big update is that industry expertise is essential. We learned from this 2015 article that industry expertise is the number one that thing that drives your compensation. And it's the number one thing that actually drives your earnings forecast. So that's a big update. You wanna really focus on understanding the industry and becoming an expert in that field. Second update. Private communication with management matters. We saw that private phone calls is one of the top drivers of earnings forecasts and stock recommendations. So in addition to becoming industry experts, you want to make sure that you nurture and preserve that relationship with management. My third update would simply be this. Sell-side analysts use the DCF model much more than we previously thought. In fact, in this updated article that we just looked at, it looks like DCF is being used almost as much as PE and EBITDA multiples. So it looks to me like the underutilized model right now is the residual income model, but DCF and multiples are very commonly used. Okay, I hope that's helpful as you're preparing to go be sell-side equity analysts to understand a little bit about how they operate, how they function, what models they use, and which models seem to be more and less effective.